YouTube, it's your boy, Sean Matry, here with How to Be Good at Yu-Gi-Oh! Now, this doesn't only reach out to Duel Links, this reaches out to Master Duel, TCG, whatever you want to play. I'm going to give you maybe about five, six tips to how to become a good Yu-Gi-Oh! player. Now, some of you I know come into my chat or watch the videos and you're like, Sean, I can't get King of Games. I'm not good at the game. I, I can only get up to Platinum. Or I don't know how to proceed to do well at tournaments or in a KC Cup. I'm nervous. Alright. So, with that being said, there's a lot that goes into being a good player at the game. And I think it starts from the deck building. I think deck building is very important. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, tip number one. Alright, so tip number one is deck building. I'm going to write this down as I go over the tips and that way, you know, you can kind of follow along. Okay, uh, give me like one second here. Okay, so tip number one is deck building. Now deck building, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, yeah. Deck building is very essential and very important because uh, you need to know, in order to do well, you need to know how to build your deck effectively. And in order to build your deck effectively, you got to real recognize a uh, few applications. One application is consistency. One application is um, text that help you win the game. That's another application. Uh, knowing what cards you want to run at certain amounts. And knowing overall what cards work best in the deck and are not situational. So, for example, we're going to go into Scud over here. And we're going to look at the deck list. Now, again, this applies for Master Duel. If you're a Master Duel, like Master Duel, this applies the same way. I mean, it's a little bit more, I think, cookie cut in Master Duel because in Master Duel and in TCG, there's obviously like blah, uh, absolute staples. I think we have more staples in Master Duel than we do in Duel Links. Because in Duel Links, it kind of gets a bit diverse, and I'll explain what I mean by that um, in a second. But let's go over the deck building process that I like. So here's an example of a deck called Earth Machine. All right, now I'm not gonna go over what every card does. Just know that um, we have, um, yeah, a bunch of uh, engine going on here, but a deck that's uh, going on over here. Okay, anyway. Um, so looking at this deck list, we have, uh, we have to start out by looking at what is our deck's goal? So that's the first thing. What is the deck trying to do? now? That is a very important thing to become a good Yu-Gi-Oh player. Well, the minute I start deck building, I, I have to ask myself, what is my deck trying to accomplish? How am I winning the game? Right? Because you have different kinds of decks that can do different things, kinds of things. So, for example, if you were to play a deck like S-Force, S-Force relies on, you know, controlling your opponent, winning via cards like Chase, and starting off to control the board with cards like Giamaro, as well as getting their flicking effects. However, if you take a deck like Earth Machine, Earth Machine relies on, you know, summoning out your big boss monsters, clearing the field, and winning the game, and using a card like Machina Citadel to clear my opponent's field on their turn or my turn. Okay, so that's that. Now, if you're playing something like Master Duel and you're playing a deck like maybe Super Heavy Samurai, maybe you want to see Wakaoshi the most consistent, or if you're playing Branded, you want to see as many routes to get to Branded Fusion as possible, whether that's ways to dump off retribution, using um, using uh, blazing Cartesia to help facilitate you getting more consistent fusion summons. Uh, there's a lot of different things to do to increase the consistency and figure out what you're doing or trying to figure out how you're winning the game. So those are just some different examples for you. Now, in Earth Machine, we now know how we're winning the game, right? I just discussed that we're using big chunk of manga bodies to get over our opponent's monsters. Now, the next thing I do is after I figure out winning the game, I go through the whole art type and I look for the best starting cards in our deck, the best starters. Now, right off the bat, I look for our, now this is like, like this is not as clear cut as something like S-Force because S-Force is kind of like its own one engine in the deck. Like, what I say engine, and this is a very important term in Yu-Gi-Oh! that people do not understand, and it's that engine means that it's like a small group of an R-type, uh, or a specific amount of cards that make up a group that 
you fit into a deck to help facilitate your deck to go or a certain combo to go off or a certain something to work another cog to work so think of it like at a factory we have multiple cogs maybe that uh, that secondary cog helps you out boost up the first cog so you get a working machine multiple different parts so in this um, specific deck we're using an Infinitrack engine to facilitate a whole deck called Earth Machine and a Makata engine. So we're using two different engines here. Okay, now each of these engines are going to have their own different starters. Hence, we might be able to increase the consistency um, of these decks that use multiple engines um, even more. Now there are downsides obviously sometimes when you use multiple engines could break, but it's not in this case. One of the most popular TCG decks that use multiple engines is uh, Chaos Dragons. They use the Light Swan engine and the Chaos Dragons themselves. Or you use, um, you take a look at another deck, you sometimes uh, branded that uses maybe a Shadol engine, or you know, you take a look at another deck like IDS, which is Invoke Dogmatica Shadow, which use three engines. It used the Invoked engine, used the Dogmatica engine, and used Shadow in Master Duel, which is a very popular deck called IDS. Okay? But in this deck, we're using two different engines. Now, Anyway, going back, now the next thing I do is I look at and see all the best cards that can help start my combos. So a starter is any card that basically helps you begin your combos or begin whatever playstyle it is. Now, I say any playstyle because if we look at a deck like Alter Guys without Pukery and Duel Links, it's not really a combo deck, it's more a control deck. And so is S-Force, it's another control deck. So I don't want to say combo necessarily, but you get what I'm referring to here. Now. In this case, I'm looking for the best starter cards. Well, Infinitrack have a lot of starter cards. I look at Infinitrack Harvester, right? That allows me to add any Infinitrack. Great! So on normal summit, it's a Stratos. So we call it Stratos or a Rota effect. Any effect that basically adds from your deck to your hand. So we call that a Rota, we call that a Stratos because they're two of the most iconic cards to search in Yu-Gi-Oh's history. So I look at Infinitrack Harvester. Harvest is great. I can normal summon it with ease. So it makes it so I don't have to tribute or do any crazy effects to get my combos going. And it just allows me to get into combo very, very easily. And I look at another starter in the deck, Heavy Forward. Heavy Forward is not an Infinitrack card, but it allows us to add an Infinitrack monster from our deck to our hand. Hence, it's a starter, a Rota effect. Now, not every starter is a Rota. You know, you look at something like Hajun of the Mayakashi that summons out of the deck. It's not a Rota, but heck, summoning out of the deck is really cool, right? And then we look at, sometimes you can have something that can lead to a starter. So if you have something like Orcus, Orpar is not directly a starter, but maybe if you pair it with something like a Machina Fortress and a Prep Solution, you discard that to the graveyard, then it can become a starter in that sense of fashion. So there's a lot of ways, but I'm looking for the most direct starters. When I say direct, I mean cards that initially start me without having to do anything crazy. So, Brutal Dozer is kind of a direct starter. Most of the time it is. You need to sacrifice an Earth Machine to special summon it. So I don't have to burn my normal summon, but I do need an Earth Machine on the field to be able to use it to deck, which allows me to effect it, which allows me to summon a machine out of my deck. But then, uh, an infinite track out of my deck, excuse me. But it locks me into Earth Machines for the rest of the turn. But again, the locking in part, not that relevant, but what's very important is I need to tribute a monster. But, again, uh, that's more of a specific starter, but that's okay. It's okay to have a little bit of specific starters as long as you have a lot of starters that can start their, uh, by themselves in their deck, as we call them one-card starters. Okay. However, if we look at our secondary engine, our Machina engine allows us to special summon themselves to the field. So something like Fortress, I can discard a machine and itself, or just a level 8 or higher machine, special summon itself. But then I don't have to give up my normal summon. I got a body on the field. And that also gets me to my Brutal Dozer combo. So that's just something you want to take a look at as well. Alright, so now that I got that out of the way. And we took a look at the starters. The next thing I do when it comes to deck building is I decide uh, what tech cards I want to put in my deck. So obviously techs vary from meta to meta. It does not matter if you're playing TCG. It does not matter if you're playing Master Duel. It does not matter if you're playing Duel Links. You know, for example, a Master Duel, DD draw a nightmare may be good in one meta may be really good in the pearly meta it may be really good in the dragon link meta and a super heavy samurai meta decks that want to search multiple times in a turn that you're going to cut off or against monodium 
and then it may be bad in another matter. You know, a deck like Sword Soul that's in search a lot of times in the turn. So being able to activate and resolve a draw and lock on Sword Soul probably isn't going to help you out a ton. But Sword Soul is not meta. It's not meta in Master, but it's not the point. Or it's kind of shaky against full Paracast Jira, even though they can surge multiple times in the turn depending on what their hand is. You know, if they open up Rysoth and then they have to summon out, you know, Unicorn or Fevrier to get the combo going and search Rysoth. But that's kind of specific. Still could be decent against that, but it's not meta because it got slammed with Bandless, but not the point. In Duel Links, we have cards like Book of Moon. Now, Book of Moon may be great one meta, but it may be really bad the next meta. And the reason I say this is because cards like Book of Moon are not great again right now. You may say, well, why wouldn't you want to play Book of Moon? It flips your opponent's monster face down and it stops their turn. Now, while that may be true, you got to take this into account. Look at what the meta decks are, and we'll get to this in a bit. Does Book of Moon help when they have a Constell or Omega on the field? If they activate their Omega, they can protect all their monsters from spell and Constellers from spell and tribe effect. That is the top tier deck at the moment. Does Book of Moon help when you're going second into a deck like Live Twin, which mainly focuses on Link Summoning? No. So you take a look at those things, and maybe Book of Moon is not the tech call right now. Now, obviously, in Duel Links, it's a little bit more difficult because it is a money-based game, and you, not everyone can afford to spend on the level that, you know, other people could spend, which is fine. And again, going back to that very same statement that I said earlier, you know, with the money spending, blah, 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 you look back and you say, oh, okay, um, you know, I can't run this card, now I'm in trouble. No. First of all, if you're going for King of Games, you can run pretty much whatever tech you want in Duel Links, and it's not going to really matter too much. Master Duel gets a little bit more specific, but Master Duel is a free-to-play game anyway. But Duel Links, you could pretty much run Book of Moon over something which would be more optimal, like a DD Crow, and you would be fine. But if we're talking super optimal for, like, KC Cubs and tournaments, yeah, you're going to want to run more optimal techs in your list, or you may start to feel uh, the regression show us me, sort of speak. So I, anyway, I start to think what techs are most optimal. And I also don't only really look for the meta, but I look for my deck. I say, okay, I think this out in my head. I say, would I want to draw a Book of Moon here? Would I rather have a Book of Moon over another card? And this is what I go toward calling valuing cards. Do I value a Book of Moon over drawing another level seven monster? That will help me extend my combo. If I draw a book, if I run Book of Moon in the deck, how will that hit the consistency of my deck? Consistency is very important, and as I said, gathering all the starters that are good in your deck and putting a certain amount of, of a lot of those in your deck is very important because gathering those starters we talked about earlier that affects consistency, and consistency is a very important thing when deck when becoming a good player in Duel Links. If your deck is not consistent, you're going to struggle. And that's why a lot of people, a lot of duelists begin to struggle. They can't build a consistent deck. And so they ask themselves, well, why am I not seeing the cards that I need to see? Why am I not seeing my starters? Well, maybe your deck's inconsistent. Maybe you're running three dark calls in your deck when you don't really need it and it's not helping you win games. That one copy of Dark Hole, there's one of those three copies of Dark Hole that you put in your deck against uh, it may win you one duel out of ten, but is that really helping you win? No, you know, and that's very, very important to ask yourself. Are the certain cards in your deck giving you value? And do you value certain cards over others? So, for example, I could easily throw three Book of Moons in this machine deck. I'd be fine with it, right? And say, okay, Book of Moon goes in this deck. Not that I think Book is the right choice in the minute, but I'm just going to make an example here. Okay, well, now I drew a Book of Moon where I could have seen a Machina. Is that Book of Moon really helping me extend through my opponent's board going second? No. Okay, is it going to help me against the meta? No. So that's the thing. That's what's very important. And I'd rather have more extenders. And again, this kind of goes back to where I said goals matter. Okay, well, if I'm playing something like Earth Machine, I want to have Earth Machines on the field. Why? Because I ha if I have Citadel in the grave and they destroy one of my monsters, I can revive back that Citadel. And then if I could get more bodies on the field, it's going to be hard for them to avoid reviving Citadel me reviving Citadel because I have three monsters on the field and it's going to be tough. Okay, so that's tough to get rid of all three. Okay, so that takes care of the tech portion. 
Now, how do I know what's a good tech? You're gonna say, oh, how do I know what's up with my deck? Well, you gotta evaluate based upon the meta. What does the meta call for? Well, right now, I'm gonna give you a hint, hint, if you're watching this video on bomb release. The meta right now is Ubel, Live Twin, Constellar, um, maybe a bit of, or maybe some Earth Machine, and maybe a little bit of, of um, Rocket Action, kind of gets a little bit of the low tier threes, and yeah, an S-Force. That's pretty much what our meta is. There are some like, you know, rogue decks out there like Cosmo, maybe Alter Guys, but that's pretty much what the meta looks like right now, and it's inside of a nutshell. And you gotta be looking at the meta and say, okay, what do all these decks attempt to do? Well, if I take a look at a deck like Constellar, which is one of the best decks in the game, given that it's a tier two or one deck, if you don't know what the tiers mean, basically tier one means that it is going to be the best deck, unless it's tier zero, then it's like undeniably the best deck and everyone's playing it, over 60% of players. Uh, tier one means the best deck, tier two means a reasonable amount of people play it, you should take an account for it. And tier 3 means you'll see it once in a while, and rogue means you'll see it rarely or not at all. Now, if I'm looking at tier 2 and tier 1 decks, those are the decks that I want to account for. So something like Constellar is a deck that is not only free to access, but also the best deck. One of the best decks. So, in that case, it's going to be on the ladder, it's going to be in tournaments, and I have to account for it. So looking at the meta and analyzing based upon that and making my deck building choices is very important. Now, in this case, I looked at my deck and I planned this all out. I looked and I said, okay, what do they end on turn one? Well, they're gonna end on an Omega. They're gonna likely end on a Pallades and maybe two set cards or a set card and a hand trap like a Veil or a DD Crow. How do I beat that? Can I beat that going second? Now you can't say, the easiest thing for you get player to do is say, okay, I could do this turn one. And that's easy to say because there's so many YouTube combos out there that everyone looks at the YouTube combos and says, hey, look, my deck can do this turn one. Right? If you look at a deck, take a deck like a Master Duel, right? Like Monadium, right? And you look at Monadium and you say, hey, with one card, I can end on Abelusa, Bestial Dust Potter, and end on Barone de Fleur with one card. Okay, great. But what is, how big is your engine? It's large. Okay, how many hand traps can you fit in? Not a lot? Okay. Do you easily lose the draw and max eight? Yeah? Yeah, then you're probably not that great of a deck at the moment, right? Uh, you know, so you gotta look at all the, not only the turn ones, but turn two. What is your deck doing? And it's less apparent in Master Duel because there's a lot more coin flips, but in Duelings, what is your deck doing on turn two? Now, Earth Machine, I feel, is one of the best decks because this deck can play very well going second. Like, if you look at any of my YouTube 15 and all the cock highlights, you will see that we beat Live Twin consistently going second. And, and being that is one of the toughest things to do because you generally see them end on three to four disruptions on their first turn, which is not the easiest thing to play through. And I say this. I always say this, a good, great Yu-Gi-Oh players are determined by their ability to break boards. If you see a Yu-Gi-Oh player be able to break fields and win and sometimes OTK through three disruptions or more, that's a telltale sign they pretty much know what they're doing. You know, they've evaluated, they know what you can do, and the chances are they know their your deck more than you even know your own deck. Because they, they know where to interrupt you and you may not know where to interrupt them. It's very easy for the player on the receiving end of them breaking that field to get very nervous. Okay, anyway, now that we've evaluated what text we want to play. So, for example, I looked at Constellar, right? Going back to that argument. I say, what does Constellar lose to? Well, it loses to Infect Veiler. Okay, how? Well, if they summon their Somber, I can Veiler it. Then they do, may not have combo. Okay, great. I could also run DD Crow. What does DD Crow do for me? Well, if I activate DD Crow in response to their Somber, it targets a monster in the graveyard to add back to their hand. I can banish that monster. Okay, great. See, so these are different ways to stop the deck. Now, something like Book of Moon isn't as effective because of Omega, right? So I look at that. Now, what else is DD Crow gets, good against in the meta? Live Twin, right? If they summon their Kiss a Kill, they activate to resummon their Lila, we Crow their Lila, and that might end their turn. So that's something very, very important to understand. This is game knowledge and it is very important. Okay, we're gonna get into that in a second, more into that in a second. Now, that's pretty much that as far as deck building. And then one other thing I want to go over, 
Okay? Is how do I, what do I put cards one, two, and three copies in? This is a common question I get all the time. Should I run the set two? Should I run the set three? Should I run the set one? What do I put at one, two, or three? Okay. Ratios are determined by how much you value a card. And this goes back to card value. Now, mostly, your best start is you're going to run at three. And this goes for mass, and goes for ECG, goes for dueling. There is no scenario where you're not going to run three Super Heavy Samurai Wakashi in a Super Heavy deck. That's just not going to happen. Because it is the best starter in the deck. And you want to see it. Okay? Now, in Duel Links, it's, it gets a little bit more of a complication. Because you do have 20 cards. Okay? Now, 20 cards, everyone's going to say, Great! I see what I want to see! More consistent! Hurrah! Okay, great. But also, remember, in 20 cards, you're going to see those Garnets a lot more frequently. And you're also going to open up multiple copies of that starter. So you got to take that in mind. It's very easy... And Duel Links to say, well, I'm going to open up two Harvesters and I'm going to open up, you know, two Heavy Forwards. Well, then great. Then I don't have as good of a hand as I want because then my hand is, is filled with all starters. So it's a brick, a little bit bricky, right? So in Duel Links, it gets a little bit more tricky. But still, generally, 90% of the time, you're running three of your best starters. And if that's the case and you feel you're going to get more bricks, increase the deck size. So for example, here... I have Earth Machine being run at 25 cards. 25 cards is good for Earth Machine because it allows me to say, okay, I'm running this at 25 cards, so that way I have the option to, um, you know, not open up as many multiple copies of a starter as once. Also, keep in mind, some skills are consistency boosts, like this, level 5 reload. I can shuffle with level 5 to get another card. So that can help me potentially unbreak my hand. So keep that in mind as well. Sometimes your consistency skills are a buff. Now, going on forward into that uh, same statement, okay? Now, three running cards at three are cards you want to see the most. Cards that, okay, you risk the ability to open up multiple of them, but you still value them enough because they help you really win the game at a high level. Okay, great. So those are the cards you want to put at three. For example, Infinite Track Harvester is my best starter. I want to see it at three because it's going to really help me win the game. And, uh, Makata Redeployment is one of my best starters. Now I'm going to run at three. Now, are there tech cards you run at three? Sure. In, in a meta that is good for it, you may run Book at three. It's not the meta for it. it some metas, Valor is great to run at three. This might be the meta for it. Because those are tech cards you want to open because they can help win when your opponent goes first. Okay, and some back row cards like Ice Dragon's Prison, Crackdown, or cards you may want to run in multiple copies. But Ice Dragon's Prison, be careful. You can only activate one IDP per turn, and if your opponent, if you're, you have two, then you can't use both of them in that same turn. So that might hurt you. So keep that in mind. That's why some people may run into two copies. Okay, now, going on forward, we look at the twos. What would I want to run into? Well, cards that I want to see, but I don't want to see multiple up. Cards that help me win, but I don't want to see multiple of. So some examples of this might be Forbidden Droplet. Some decks, other than Light Twin, which I think you want to play three of because it really does help in that deck. Uh, some decks, like Constellar, may want to play it at two. It may not play it at all, but some decks may want to play it at two. Because it's a card that you can help you win on the opponent's turn, but it's really going to stick opening up multiple of it. Because it takes a lot of value, okay, to use. So keep that in mind. All right, and other cards you may want to run it to, or maybe something like Cosmic Cyclone or Mystical Space Typhoon, because while these cards can help you win going second, it's not the best card that you want to see going first because it may not disrupt your opponent. So that's something you want to keep in mind, okay? And then the cards you wouldn't want are generally the Garnets, the cards you really don't want to see. Uh, I personally, most of the time, do not like running text at one, unless it's like, okay, this is a card I could throw in and I have the room to do so. Because I feel like if you're running a tech at one, you're basically planning on never seeing it and rarely ever seeing it. So, like, you're not really making a game plan at that point. So, yeah. Anyway, we're 25 minutes in. That is deck building. Okay. Now we're going to get on to the next portion of our guide. And I'm going to show you something. All right. We're going to go into a test duel here. And I'm going to show you my whole thought process. All right, now this is gonna be against the computer. Don't worry about it. I'm just gonna show you my whole thought process behind while I do things. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna go over is um, PSCT. 
Now, problem solving card text is a very important thing when it becomes being a Yu-Gi-Oh player. Now, this is not the easiest thing to grasp. It takes time. But being a great Yu-Gi-Oh player, the top tier players, know the problem solving card text. So, for example, let's say you're playing something like Yu Bell, right? If you're playing something like Yu Bell and you are um, going against the opponent and your opponent uses Effect Veiler on your Ultimate Nightmare, you may say, Oh, my Effect Veiler is negated. My Ultimate Nightmare is negated. I can't attack. That's, I'm going to take damage. Now, while that's partly true, that's not fully true. Ultimate Nightmare has something where it occurs in damage calculations. Damage calculation involves rules of battle. Damage calc occurs as the last thing to happen, and that occurs after the monster is destroyed. So for example, if they go to kill your ultimate nightmare, you can resolve when it's off the field. So when you go to burn your opponent and destroy their monster, that can occur off the field. So if your opponent uses effect failure, yes, you may take the battle damage, but no, you could still use the effect to destroy their monster. A lot of players on the ladder do not know this. So they end up losing out on a duel because they did not know the card rulings. So that's very, very important. Okay? Secondly, what's also very important is that you have to understand that um, other rulings like, okay, one big rule, and I'm going to go over a few because otherwise we'll be here all day. But, um... One is missing the timing. Now, a lot of people have no idea what this means and no idea when this occurs. Missing the timing occurs when you have one effects, okay? That means that you have um, multiple different things occurring. Uh, not multiple different things, but I should say a card effect that hasn't finished resolving yet and you're kind of caught in the middle. So for example, look at a card like Vampire Duke. If your opponent activates something like Harpy's Hunting Ground and you chain Vampire Takeover and you summon your Duke and then Harpy's Hunting Ground is uh, once your Vampire Takeover is finished summoning and your Duke comes out, then you says this timing can activate in front and you're like, how? Well, it's a one effect. Since Vampire Duke was summoned before Harpy's Hunting Ground can fully resolve, you will not get the effect because Harpy Sunning Ground will cause it to miss timing. Okay? If effects are mandatory, they cannot miss the timing. One effects are optional effects that can miss timing. If you take another look at another thing, Brave Neos versus Six Samurai Fuma. Fuma is a one effect when it is destroyed in battle, you summon out a Six Samurai in the deck. However, when your opponent attacks it with Brave Neos, they get to search their card before your Super Heavy would attempt to activate. Henceforth, you miss the timing. Okay, missing the timing is very, very important. It does not really occur too much in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Because a lot of cards are built to, with if effects now. But there are some old cards that will miss timing. And you gotta be really careful with this because smart players will know how to get you to miss the timing. Yubel actually used to have a common occurrence with this before, you know, rulings came into place. So what people would actually attempt to do is use a card like uh, Six Samurai Yubel Mirror Meta, way, way, way back one. Uh, your opponent used to activate something like Dual Wield on Chain Link 2 or Tretchu on Chain Link 2 because Yubel would be destroyed on a higher Chain Link. Hence, Yubel will not float because it is not the last thing to happen. The last thing to happen is not Yubel going to the graveyard. The last thing to happen is whatever your Chain Link 1 was. So you gotta make sure you keep this in mind. If you don't know how Chain Link works, basically you activate a card, then priority goes back to your opponent. The minute you activate a card or effect, your opponent gets priority. Meaning that they get to activate, you know, a certain card or effect in response to the card you already activated. Then priority goes back to you, and you are able to change your own card. Chain Burn was a very common deck in the team, and the TCG worked like this all the time. Okay, and then, since you are now with something like you, Bell, Tretch on Chain Link 2 or higher destroys it, but then your Chain Link 1 card still has to resolve, since the you, Bell won't get the effect. Okay, so that's missing the time. Another big thing where a lot of people miss on is cost and effects. Okay, and people, I tell you, I cannot tell you how many times I've seen this. Alright, they activate Karma Cut, they discard their Dark World card, and they wonder why it did not work. <laughs> okay. Costs are any part of the card 
text that comes before the semicolon is the requirement to activate a card. So for example, if you activate something like Karma Cut, it says discard one card, colon, banish one card on the target, one face-up monster, and banish it. Okay? If you activate and discard a Dark World, it is not sent for the card effect. Hence, you do not get the effect of the Dark World. It needs to be sent for the effect, not the cost. Okay? This is not Kelbeck Agito. Okay? These are not those kinds of cards that just need to be sent to the graveyard. They need to be sent by card effect. Okay? Tier Limit works in the same way. If you use something like Tier Limit Sharon or Rhino Art and you discard it for a cost, like a, I don't know, nobody plays this, but this is an example. Like Dark Core, you will not get that Tier Limit effect because it was sent for a cost. However, if you send it for a Fusion Summon, Fusion Summons are a card effect. Hence, you will get that effect. In Duel Links, if you play Shadows, you Fusion Summon for card effect. You will get the effects of Shadows. Shadows also have to be sent by card effect. If you Karma Cut a Shadow, you will not get the effect. If you Regenge Blink a Shadow, you will not get the effect. You have to keep this in mind. Well, unless you pop your own Shadow, then you will, but that's a different story. I mean, for like discarding the card itself. Okay. What's also important, and the last thing I want to go over as really comes up, is something uh, where it. Uh, okay. Negating effects. Okay. Now, this is very important. Uh, if you activate Effect Veiler on something like, um, yeah, if you activate Effect Veiler on a monster and they discard something and, and like, cost, right, and you have an effect that says, like, discard for cost or whatever they put to the grade, right, or they use, like, a Veiler on an Exceed monster and they de detach for cost, and they go, hey, you can't do that, I negated it, I negated it. No, you simply negated the effect. Remember, you could still pitch for cost. So... They can still get a card in the graveyard that they want, and you can't stop that because the veil indicates the effect, not the clause. Okay, so that's very important. All right, so those are a few PSCT rulings that you need to know. Study up on rules of battle. That is the very, very most important one that I can tell you. Cost and effect, um, missing timing. Those are probably the three that come up the most. All right, and once you memorize these rulings, then you're going to be set to be ready. Okay, and get that'll make you a much better player. Third is understanding the meta, okay? Understanding the meta is very important. If you do not know the meta and how to beat it, you're gonna be up a rabbit hole before you can even get, you're gonna be down the rabbit hole before you can even climb up, all right? A lot of people go in and they don't know what the meta is. So they can go in, like on a legend ladder, and they just bring out their magic cylinder Yugi Moto deck and they wonder why they ain't one in the game. You're not the Pharaoh. You can't draw any card you need at once. And believe it or not, the cards in Yugi Moto's deck are not the cards that are helping you win the game. <laughs> All right, Mirror Force on your opponent is not saving you. Activating your Magic Cylinder is not gonna save you. Okay, and you're not most of the time unless you're playing in a specific meta. You are not Dark Magician and attacking your opponent's life points per game. All right. So what's very important here is you have to understand what the meta is and how to counter it. As I said before in the deck building, when we decided on text. We understood what the meta is. Now, for example, something like u -Bell. How am I going to beat u -Bell? Well, they have a Neos Kluger. If I get rid of it, other than spinning it back to the deck, they are going to be able to float into an unkillable monster by card effect or pretty much by battle because you're not going to hit over it unless you like Chalice it or something. Um, so you're going to make it very hard to deal with. Plus, they're going to burn you for max damage. Uh, so how am I going to deal with it? Well, I want to generally bounce them back to their and or extra deck. Well, how do I do that? Well... I can use cards like Compulsory Evacuation Device. That's a really good deck in the meta. Does it answer the other meta decks? Yes, it does. It can still deal with Pilates, and it can still deal with other cards like uh, the Live Twins, if I needed to. So Compulsory can be a good answer in the meta. If I look at DD Crow, well, DD Crow is great against Live Twin. It's good against Constellar. Those decks like to banish cards from the graveyard before they start out their turn. Okay, so then I can use cards like DD Crow. And I also look at what decks are good against the decks in the meta. Well, Earth Machine can beat Live Twin and Constellar going second after some testing and after some thought process. Because I looked at what I think about what Live Twin can do, and I ask myself whether my deck is good enough to counter it. And then I can make that judgment based on what I feel my deck can do and what their deck can do. So it's very important you understand what the meta is, as I said. U-Bell, Rocket, uh, Live Twin, Constellar. 
okay, and how to beat it. That is very important. If you can't understand that, you are down a rabbit hole and you're not going to succeed. You have to understand it. A great resource site is go on the Do Links Meta. If you don't know what the meta is, the top player council has a great idea of the meta. Then look it up, go to the tier list, and look up those decks. And then you understand what those decks are. Or play on the ladder and you will eventually figure out what those decks are. And if you lose those decks, try to figure out how you're going to beat them. Okay, next is do not get mad about how you lose. Okay, do not get mad about losing. All right, first of all, I say don't get mad, get smart. All right, first of all, it's very easy for someone to say, Luck, I hate it. I lost because I was unlucky. I didn't draw the card I needed. My opponent was luckier than me. Okay, that's a cop out. All right, sometimes that does happen. It is a card game. You can lose by luck. And the KC Cup really de demonstrates that because you can easily, in the wrong metas, lose four or five duels in a row because it does get coin flippy, and then you're in that bad situation. But never try, please try not to blame luck. Because I'm going to tell you something. About 75-80% of the time, it's something you could have done. Okay, you could have done differently to win that game. So... Everyone will turn around. You'll turn around and go, I hate this game. I lost because I was unlucky. My opponent drew more than I did. That, Like I said, that can happen. However, most of the time, I evaluate because of luck. Was there, was there, did I play, did I make a reckless play? Could I have played a little bit more conservatively to win the game? Now, sometimes there are scenarios where it's like, okay, this is a bad scenario anyway. It's a tough decision. And I could have, you know, do I make this play or miss that play? And then evaluate. After every duel, sit there for a minute. Evaluate how that duel went. Even if you want it, evaluate it. Do not go about winning a duel and say, I won, I won, I won, yay. No, because that's not getting smart. You could actually win a duel and make five misplays in a duel. And that could happen, okay? You could play your deck like total crap, and your opponent has no idea how your deck works, and then you win the duel anyway. Or maybe your opponent just bricked, and then at that point, then you won the duel, and you don't know why you won there's a why to everything. Make sure you're answering that why. And don't blame your losses on luck. Because it's very easy. Sometimes you get tilted and like things happen. But just try not to blame your losses on luck. Don't do it. Okay. Next, uh, I want to talk about uh, is uh, learn mistakes. Okay. People make mistakes all the time. All right. In duelings, um, Josh Schmidt really touches on this. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody misplays. Learn from them. All right. Uh, it's very easy to misplay, and it's very easy to start, you know, uh, for someone to turn around to you and say, Oh, you misplay, you suck! Okay, they need to look at the mirror because they misplayed too. I can guarantee you every single Yu-Gi-Oh player on this planet has misplayed at one point or another. Okay, and it probably at multiple times and in multiple events. Alright, misplays happen. Sometimes you can't think of everything. You know, you're a human. You know, you're not a robot. But... The best players know how to position themselves the majority amount of times to be in a winning spot. Learn from your mistakes, and sometimes, like, the best ways to learn from to, how to beat a deck is just gain experience, go on the ladder. You know, allow the misplays to happen, and then learn from them. You know, learn. You say, okay, what could I have done better in that spot that could have won me the game? You know, sometimes uh, this kind of goes into my next tip, and my next tip is don't play too fast. This is something that I'm a victim of, and a lot of players are a victim of, all right? Sometimes, you are lightning hands. You know the combos, you know what you want to do, you have a good idea of the meta, and it's just like, you all get this huge thing of rote memory, and you just want to play. You need to think before committing, okay? I can't tell you this. When I go into a tournament, I always think, if you watch my last tournament run, I have to think, all the scenarios. You have to think before committing. It's like in a relationship. Everyone wants to commit before they can actually make it, before uh, they actually think about where the relationship is going to go. But you have to think it out to make sure that everything works out the way you want it to do. Right? So commitment is very important. All right? Think it out. Think the line out. Think about what they could have. So, for example, if I'm playing Mastral, can I combo through an Ash? You know, it's easy to get a line in your head and then go boom, boom, boom. And not think about what hand traps can have. What happens if they have a draw? Do I have an answer if they have a draw? Sometimes the answer is I gotta make my play and hope they don't have it. That's sometimes the answer. But sometimes there's an answer that says, all right, I can make this play if they through if they have draw. If they have a veiler, then I go for this line. 
Or sometimes you make the play, attempting to go for a full combo, and by the day of the Baylor, then you're ready to go to a different plan. Smart players, top tier players, know how to divert and know how to play around entrance. So keep that in mind and, and around back row as well. Don't rush your plays. That's a very common mistake, okay? Don't do that. Try not to. All right. Four. Okay, and then this is my next tip. Reading delays. And we're going to go into this. We're going to play the sand out. This is my last tip for you. Read delays. I cannot tell you enough. People lose duels because they don't know how to read delays properly. So they just recklessly play in the back row without thinking about it. All right. Now, I'm going to teach you an example duel here. I want you to look at my screen. So pretend that Yami Yugi is playing the best deck, Constellar. All right. So the very first intuition I'm going to have is... The very first thing that goes in my mind if I'm going turn one is I'm thinking about Valor and Crow. That is my thought process here. So, if I'm afraid of Valor, what I'm going to do is I am going to say, okay, what can I do to get around a Valor? Well, immediately you can see I have a redeployment in my hand. If my opponent activates Effect Valor on my Harvester, then I have the ability to have redeployment and get an Air Raider to potentially revive back my Sitted out. This is an example of a way that you can play through cards like Effect Valor. And that makes this deck very good. If your deck is able to play through hand traps, that is generally a positive sign that your deck might be a good deck. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to first then summon my Harvester. Now, obviously, I can't know if they're going to have Valor until I have a monster on my field. Because there needs to be something initially causing the delay. If I know it's this of the delay in the draw phase, I know that's not Valor. Because there's nothing in my... I know that's not Valor Crow because there's nothing in my graveyard. And there's nothing on my field to prompt the Valor. Think about this. If they have a delay in the draw phase, it might be a Thunder Dragon Dark. Okay, that can happen. All right, I could say Artifact Lancey, but nobody plays Lancey in this meta. So <laughs> try not to think about that. But that could be something too, if you really want to go to that level of extension. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to summon out uh, Infinite Track Harvester. Now I'm going to give you a note. If you see a delay, let's say you activate a spell card, right? And you see a delay, and you're going to go, what's that delay? Okay, always make sure you're paying attention to delays in off phase and standby phase, because then you'll know this right off the bat. But if you only see a delay in main phase when you activate a spell, chances are you're facing Arsardic, because they cause all delays in main phase, because they can only be used in main phase. And you'll know instantly when you go to battle phase and their delays are toggled off. So pay attention to the hourglass all the time. So I'm going to activate Harvester. If I see a delay here, right at this point, I have nothing in my graveyard. I have nothing else in my graveyard, so I know that's an effect failure. So that's something I need to know. Now, if I know it's an effect mailer, that may change my line of play. All right, so if I go to activate Harvester, I have to think about what I'm gonna search. If I go for Brutal Dozer, I could force out the effect mailer, but then I may not have a follow-up. So there's something you may wanna keep in mind, okay? Now, if you're playing a deck like S-Force, there's something really cool you can do, which if you're playing S-Force, you can activate Shio in the end phase, big brain play, because you, they cannot veil you in the end phase. Veil can only be activated in the main phase. So something to keep in mind. All right. Now I'm gonna search my brutal dozer. Now at this point, I'm gonna link off. The reason why this is a good idea is because you can check for a DD Crow now. Since we know DD Crow is very popular, we can link it off, and we immediately check for a DD Crow. If I do not see a delay in his hand, that means I can go full combo. So these are things I want to keep in mind. Now. Also, another important thing is, let's say I'm going second. If I see no delay on my normal summon, that means my opponent probably does, my opponent does not have a warning point, does not have a book. If I see a delay only when my monster hits the graveyard, that means they have an Ice Dragon's Prison. Another thing is, if your opponent does not book your Harvester on normal summon and they let you link in, and you don't see it, and you see a delay on normal summon, and they allow you to link summon, and then you don't see a delay, then you know they have Book of Moon because they cannot book a link. So using that kind of knowledge can help you figure out what cards your opponent may or may not be having. So these are things that you want to know. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here, okay? Because uh, this video is already 45 minutes long. I uh, want to be two hours. And yeah, uh, I'll, I'll stop here. And yeah, if you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and sub. Um, if you have any questions, Ask me. I'm going to be doing cog climbs left and right. Please ask. I will be happy to answer ruling questions, uh, deck questions, anything you might happen to ask about Duel Links, and even something about Master Duel that you want to know. I'm here for you. I'm not mean. 
I do not bite. I'm not mean. I'm also hope I would. Uh, I'm also gonna install my second monitor. Hopefully by tomorrow or Monday, so I can see all your comments on the YouTube side. I'm gonna have it all fixed up for you guys. So please like, comment, sub. Thank you. Love you all. And so I'm gonna try signing out. Peace. Bye YouTube.